I'll tell you, we just might have turned the corner on Friday. I mean, I think we'd all agree that during the early part of last week, the weather was horrible, you know, with all the heat and humidity. Man, it felt like we were living under water. And I think I'm safe in saying that all that was unusually bad this year. Because the humidity made some of the cold water pipes and valves sweat. With the condensation running down and saturating the ceiling above the stairwell, causing it to come down last week. Now that hadn't happened in the past, but it happened this year. Now, I, I recognize that's not as bad as a shark attack, but it isn't great either. Let's just say the weather's been awful. But not yesterday or today. Outside of some rain, the temperature has come down. And based on the Weather Channel app on my phone, it's supposed to pretty much stay down for the next couple of weeks. And even though it may be a little premature to say that we've seen the last of the heat and humidity, I think the worst of it may be over. Praise the Lord. And before you know it, snow. Which I know makes Star happy. But be that as it may, as, we sort of, as we're sort of cooling down a little bit, we're continuing our study of how we might apply the Sermon on the Mount to our daily living. And to get to where we are, we've considered the Beatitudes and the responsibility we have to be salt and light. And we've discussed problems associated with anger and immorality, especially for Christians. And we've considered why and how we might want to work on our integrity and our generosity and our love. And a few weeks ago, we shifted gears a little bit and looked at how, when doing certain things, we need to focus our attention on God and not others. And we applied that to how we give and how we pray. Something we should be doing with a clear focus and a willingness to forgive. Now, that's what we've talked about. And this morning, we're going to look at the third action that directly relates to these words of Jesus Christ, Beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. I mean, just like I said a little bit ago, he's already explained how it related to giving. And he already explained how it related to prayer. And now he applied it to something that I think most of us have done, but probably not for the reason Jesus had in mind. He said... And whenever you fast, do not look dismal like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces so as to show others that they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your father who is in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. Now, that's going to be our focus this morning, fasting. And as we look at this spiritual discipline, again, we're going to answer three questions. That's going to be our, kind of our structure. We're going to answer the question, what is fasting? And why should we fast in secret? And how can we fast effectively? And I'll tell you, when you start looking at what fasting is, I think it's really important to be clear about what it's not. At least the kind of fasting that Jesus had in mind. You see, like I said a little while ago, I think most of us have fasted sometime in our lives. For example, if you've ever had blood work done, you probably had to fast, right? That's what they call it. And that's also true of going in for everybody's favorite procedure. And now I'm talking about a colonoscopy. I'll tell you, turning 50 certainly has its downsides. Now, that's really not what Jesus was thinking about when he taught about, was talking about fasting. Nor was he, was he talking about a diabetic passing on dessert. That's not fasting. Or a, a, a vegan wannabe reaching for a celery stalk instead of a, a, a drumstick. And it's definitely not putting a spiritual spin on missing a meal. Now, that's not what fasting is all about. Although I grant you, biblical fasting involves not eating, which also means being really hungry. 
Remember a little earlier in his gospel, Matthew wrote, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He, what? Fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. I mean, duh. Now, that's what happened to Jesus. But I'll tell you, fasting was more than just giving out food. There was always a deeper, a more, well, a more spiritual purpose involved. For example, just listen to what the evangelist Luke wrote in Acts. Now, the church at Antioch, now in the church in Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, uh, Mana, Manaen, a member of the court of Herod, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. You see, this was something that people did so that they might move closer to God. And as it related to Jesus and his disciples, this was also something for which Jesus took a little bit of heat. Just listen. When the disciples of John came to him saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, The wedding guests cannot mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them, can they? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken from them, and they will fast. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old cloak, for the patch pulls away from the cloak, and a worse tear is made. Neither is new wine put into old wineskins. Otherwise, the skins burst open, the wine is spilt, and the skins are destroyed. But new wine is put into fresh wineskins, and both are preserved. And so according to the Bible, fasting was giving up food for a religious, a spiritual reason. Now that's what it was. Question number one. And why did Jesus think it should be done in secret? Well, I think it, we can break it in, we can break that question into two parts. I mean, why is fasting important and why should it be done in secret? And I think we can better understand its importance by looking at why people in the Bible fasted. For example, sometimes people fasted when they needed some guidance from God. Sort of like we see way back in the Old Testament book of Judges. So the Israelites advanced against the Benjaminites the second day. Benjamin moved out against them from Gebiah, Gabiah on the second day and, and struck down 18,000 of the Israelites, all of them armed men. Then all the Israelites, the whole army, went back to Bethel and wept, sitting before the Lord. And they fasted that day until evening. Then they offered burnt offerings and sacrifices of well-being before the Lord. And the Israelites inquired of the Lord. For the ark of the covenant of God was there in those days. And Phinehas, son of Eleazar, son of Aaron, ministered before it in those days. Saying, shall we go out once more to battle against our kinfolks, the Benjaminites? Or shall we desist? The Lord answered, go out, for tomorrow I will give them into your hand. You see, they wanted guidance, and that's where they fasted. And a lot of folks fasted as they prayed, you know, to sort of intensify their prayers. This was like Ezra did when he was leading the people back home. Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river Ahava, which that, they, that we might deny ourselves before our God to seek from him a safe journey for ourselves, our children, and all our possessions. For I was ashamed to ask the king for a band of soldiers and cavalry to protect us against the enemy on our way, since we had told the king that the hand of our God is gracious to all who seek him. But his power and wrath are against all who forsake him. So we fasted and petitioned our God for this, and he listened to our entreaty. You see, fasting was sort of like putting an exclamation point to their prayers. Of course, this personal sacrifice was also done as people prepared themselves to worship. In particular, worship with humility. Like it said in the Psalms, 
malicious witnesses rise up. They ask me about things I do not know. They repay me evil for good. My soul is forlorn. But as for me, when they are sick, I wore, I afflicted myself with fasting. I prayed with head bowed on my bosom as though I grieved for a friend or a brother. I went about as one who laments for a mother bowed down and in mourning. You see, it was done as a show of humility. And according to what Jesus said in Mark, fasting could also offer all kinds of strength. You see, when his disciples were frustrated that they couldn't cast out an unclean spirit and asked Jesus why they failed, he said to them, this kind can come out only through prayer and fasting. You see, these are some of the reasons people fasted in the Bible. And even though they, they all were a little different, they had a common focus, didn't they? Namely, God. And I think that really explains why Jesus believed fasting should be done in, in secret. I mean, just like it does with giving and praying, public fasting shifts the focus from God to self. And I'll tell you, that's particularly true here. My goodness, isn't that one of the perks I get from fasting? Making sure everybody knows how dedicated I am. Isn't that one of the benefits of, of me giving up food for a while? And how are they going to see the suffering I am doing for God if I don't subtly show that I'm doing it? No, I cannot join you for lunch. I am fasting. No, I cannot eat that bagel. You see, I am fasting. No, don't worry about me. Go ahead and eat all you want. Have a great time. Indulge in food. Don't worry about me. You see, I'm fasting. Ain't it great? What a guy attention has been paid. You see, it's all about focus. And I'll tell you, I think that's why Jesus said, but when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that your fasting may be seen not by others, but by your father who is in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. You see, then the focus will be on God. And that's why Jesus taught us to fast and to do it in secret. Question number two. And finally, the third question, how can we be better at doing it? Well, I think that really comes down to what we choose before, to do before, during, and after our fast. Let me explain. Before we start fasting, man, I believe we need to be really clear about our motivation. You know, our reasons, in other words, why we're doing it. For example, are we fasting to get some guidance from God? Or are we doing it to intensify our prayers? Is it a way for us to approach him with humility or to seek a little bit of his strength? Are those the possible reasons we're fasting? Or are we fasting because we think we have to? Or because everybody else is doing it? I mean, we're kind of running with the crowd. I want to fit in, so I got to fast. Or because it gives us something to talk about at the next Bible study. Well, let me tell you how, fa how I did that fast. I'll tell you, we need to be clear about why we're spiritually fasting. And if the reason has to do with anything other than God, then maybe we shouldn't do it. And as we begin to fast, well, I think there are a few things we might want to keep in mind. I mean, we really want to be successful, right? All right, let's say our motivation is really good and we want to be successful. Therefore, maybe we should start small, like fasting for a meal or giving up something we really enjoy for a while, rather than trying to fast for several days or not eating anything. And if giving up food is not your thing, you might want to consider another kind of fast. You know, like not watching television or putting aside your electronics for a while. You see, that can be a fast. And I'll tell you, while you're fasting, think about some of the things you could do. Ideally, things you could do that shows love for God and neighbor. And that could serve two purposes. I mean, on one hand, it might result in some positive action. And on the other hand, it just may take your mind off what you're missing. Now, that's some of the stuff that we can do while fasting. 
And finally, after the fast is over, I believe it's crucial to do a little evaluating about whether it was successful or not. I mean, if I don't... If it doesn't make us feel closer to God, then maybe we might want to change it up a little bit. And I'm talking about rethinking both our motivation and our sacrifice. And these are just a few ideas about how we might be effective in our fasting. Question number three. Of course, having said all that, I doubt fasting will ever become really popular. It's, that's not going to happen. I mean, giving things up to get closer to God, well, that seems to run counter the materialism and self-indulgence that seems to be part of our society. And that doesn't seem to be going anywhere. But you know, if we give it a chance and focus on what fasting is and what it's supposed to be, we just might understand not only why it's important, but also why Jesus taught that it should be done in secret. And I'll tell you, with all that information, we might be able to explore how it might be done effectively. And who knows, it might actually move us closer to God. Amen.